Uh, if you remember, next up on our list was integer arithmetic, right? And integer arithmetic is easy. It's just type 4 equals 2 plus 2. That's simple. Uh, this will work. Or maybe it won't because it's a syntax error, because this is a type. This is not an expression. Maybe I lied to you. Maybe you shouldn't trust me so easily, right? So how do we fix this? This is devastating. That's, that's a problem. How do you perform arithmetic on integers if you can't even use operators on them? Uh, hello, hello, everyone. I am Srijan, a language engineer at DeepSource. I work on the JavaScript analyzer. And today, I'm going to talk to you about writing type-level programs in TypeScript with higher-order types, right? So TypeScript is a programming language that transpiles to JavaScript. I'm sure you all know that. It's a Turing-complete language. You can compute pretty much anything with it, uh, as you can with other languages. I'm sure you know that as well. But did you know that TypeScript's type system itself is also Turing-complete? Meaning, using only type declaration statements, you can do actual computation. So what is a type-level program, right? A type-level program is a program that only has type declaration statements in it. And when you compile it, you have this one restriction that the generated JavaScript file should be empty. So it means that you cannot use any statements that can get transpiled over to runtime JavaScript which means you can use the interface keyword, you can use the type keyword, you can use namespaces, but everything else is banned, right? So I've divided this talk into two sections. In the first section, we're going to cover some commonly used features in TypeScript, which you will need to know about to understand type-level programs. And I'm going to run through these quickly. I'm going to assume that most people here already know uh, TypeScript. And after that, we're going to get to the actual meat of this talk, which is the type-level programs themselves, right? So let's begin. Uh, we take a quick refresher about some modern TypeScript features, beginning with literal types, right? So what is a literal type? Uh, I think you know this pretty well. This is your standard uh, run-of-the-mill type here. It's a gender type, which is a union of string literals. So a gender can be male, female, or non-binary. And then you can have a variable called my gender of type gender, and it's assigned a value called male, where I made a typo, actually. If you notice, the first letter is capital. It should not be capitalized. So if I try to compile this, uh, the compiler will help me out and it will say, hey, perhaps uh, you meant to say male with a small m, right? Moving on, we have typed member access. So you have this data structure, this type called post, which has a field called, you can think of this as your tweet, um, a social media post, anything, okay? And then you have a field called content, which is the content of the post. It has a type string. And then you have a type, which is the visibility of the post, which is public or private. So what I can do is I can actually use the member access operator and I can get types out of the post type. So if I do post uh, index type, it's going to give me a union type of public and private. If I do post index content, it's going to give me the string type, right? And this is again, not runtime. This is all of this is happening while you're compiling your code. There's another feature called the extends keyword, right? So what is the extends keyword? It's often used with uh, conditional type expressions. And it checks if one type is a subset of the other. So it can be used as a loose equality test of sorts. And when you say T1 extends T2, what you're really saying is if you're checking if all properties in T2 also exist in T1. To give you an example, here you have a, a type called horse, which has two properties, walk and run, right? Both of them are functions, both return void. And you have something called Pegasus, uh, which can walk. A Pegasus can run, and a Pegasus can fly. So a Pegasus can do everything that a horse can, and it can do more. So when you say Pegasus extends horse, the type system resol uh, rec resolves this value to true, and it executes this then block of the conditional expression uh, to true. This is because all Pegasus are horses, but not all horses are Pegasus, right? Extends can be used on primitives, so you can do three extends number, and that will resolve to true as well because three is more specific than number, right? All threes are numbers, not all numbers are threes. Similarly, x extends string, because all x's within double quotes are strings, but not all strings are necessarily x's within double quotes. And once again, this is a conditional expression, so you evaluate this extends value, and then based on the result of this, you evaluate either the if block, or the, like the then block, or the or block, right? 
Okay, so here's a helper type I've written using extends. So it takes a type as a parameter. This is a generic type, right? It can take a type as a parameter. It's called T. And then it checks if T extends number. And if it does, then it returns true. Otherwise, it just returns false. So you have a type A, uh, which is is num123, right? And since 123 does extend number, it's going to return true. But if 123 is inside quotations, it's a string and it's going to return false. So you can use this helper to check if a type is numeric or not. And you can see that this type acts like a function, right? It takes a type and it returns a type. So you can call this a higher order type, right? And this higher order type uh, acts like a function. So whenever I say function from here on out, I'm going to be referring to higher order type, not the runtime JavaScript functions that you write with the function keyword, none of that. We don't like that. Uh, so here's another, a little, slightly more advanced example. So you have this uh, thing called ununite. And the purpose of ununite is to remove a type from a union. So here you have a type called drinks, and drinks is a union of Coke, milk, water, and coffee. Now let's say you want to have only the good drinks, so you don't want Coke, you do none of that soda shit, right? So what you do is you do ununite drinks Coke. And when you apply an operation on a union, you're basically applying that operation to every, every member of the union type. So this will evaluate to ununite Coke Coke, or ununite milk coke, or ununite water coke, or ununite coffee coke. And since t extends k is going to be true when t and k are both coke, it's going to evaluate to never. So you're going to have never, or milk, or water, or coffee. Uh, never is a bottom type. It means no value in the language can ever have, a, can ever have the type never. Uh, so whenever you union never with x, you get back x. So you have never union milk, water, coffee, which is just coffee, or water, or milk, right? So you've successfully removed uh, a member from a union type. Up next, we have the infer keyword. And this is a lot more interesting, and it's a more recent addition, so I'm not sure if all of you have seen it. I think it was TypeScript 4.8, 4.9 that added this. And it is capable of destructuring a type, right? So we are all familiar with uh, array pattern destructuring, object pattern destructuring. That's something we do pretty much every day when writing JavaScript. But turns out we can also destructure types. And if you're familiar with functional programming, if you've used Haskell Scala, uh, OCaml, F sharp, I don't know, anything, you're definitely familiar with pattern matching, right? You've done pattern matching. Uh, you can also pattern match on types using the info keyword. So let's uh, check with an example. So here I have an example where I'm taking a tuple type and I'm flipping the order of the items inside it, okay? So I have uh, in these examples down below, one is assigned a value which is flip of number and boolean. And flip turns it around and gives me boolean and number. So how does it do that? Uh, let's look into the actual definition for flip, right? So flip checks if the compiler, so it, it says t extends infer a infer b. What does that mean? So when you say t extends this thing, what you're really saying is you're asking the compiler to check if it's possible for it to deconstruct t into a tuple type where the first item has type a and the second item has type b. If this deconstruction is possible, then you're going to evaluate the then block, which has b comma a inside it. So you flip a b to b a. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, you get t, you revert to t. So if you flip a uh, tuple with one and two inside it, you get two and one. Again, all of this is completely compile time. If you compile this file right now, zero JavaScript, because all of this is types, right? So here's a more useful example with infer, right? This is something we actually use in uh, one of our code bases. You have this helper called args, and it takes a type parameter t and checks if t can be deconstructed into a type which, have, which is a function that has an argument list of type A and a return value of type R. If this deconstruction is possible, then it returns the type of the argument list, which is A. Otherwise, it just returns never, which is to say that perhaps T is not a function uh, to begin with. So when you use the type of keyword and you pass args uh, type of math.pow, you get number number. Uh, so obviously, math.pow takes two numbers, raises the, raises the first to the power of the second. We all know that. Uh, if you do args type of document dot get element by id, you get a tuple type with a string inside it, obviously. Uh, here's a comparison between infer uh, as pattern match and a Haskell code snippet. So if you don't know Haskell, there's no need for you to worry about what's on the right, just focus on what's on the left, right? Uh, you have this function called head, a uh, higher order type. It takes a type t, it tries to deconstruct it into a tuple where the first item is x and the rest of the items are something we don't care, we use the spread operator. And then we return x, right? So we return the first item from a list, right? We return the first item from a tuple type. 
In the Haskell code snippet, we're doing something very similar. Uh, in fact, we're doing the pretty much exactly the same thing. This is a, this is a direct comparison. Uh, the only difference is in Haskell, if you compile this file right now, it's going to generate some assembly code that you're going to run. In TypeScript, if you compile this, you're going to have zero JavaScript at all. This is our compile time computation, right? You're not going to ship this to production. OK, so now we know about some tricks, uh, some features of TypeScript that we're going to leverage to actually write type level programs. So we're going to start off simple. We're going to reverse a list, your, your basic run of the mill programming exercise. Uh, then we're going to try integer arithmetic, followed by Fibonacci sequence, sorting arrays, and a little surprise at the end, right? OK, reversing the list, how do you do this? So if you have never written type level programs before, if you've never used infer or extends before, this probably looks very cryptic to you, right? Uh, let's have a closer look. So reverse is a function that takes a parameter A, which has a constraint. So when you have extends keyword in a generic uh, parameter, that's a constraint. So it says A extends unknown array. And what we mean by that is we're saying that A has to be an array. We don't care what the items in the array are. We don't care the type of the, we don't care about the specific type of the array, but we must, uh, we require that the parameter to reverse must be an array, right? So when we call reverse of A, the compiler checks if it is possible to deconstruct A into a tuple type where the first item is A0 and the other items are just termed rest. So we use the spread operator to indicate that you know rest is an array. And then if this is possible, if this deconstruction is indeed possible, we reverse uh, rest and we put A0, which was in the beginning at the end. And we recursively call reverse on rest and put that first and that will reverse your array, right? So to show you if this works or not, I'm going to head on over to my terminal here, and I have this reverse function, the one I showed you in the slide, the exact same one, uh, and I'm going to do type something is reverse of one, two, and three, right? And if I do that, you can see that it's three, two, and one, so we have reversed an array successfully. And remember, again, these are all types, these are not values, so if I have number here, it's going to give me three, two, and number. Right, very useful, very cool, very nice. Uh, but what else can we do? So we can reverse a list. Uh, if you remember, next up on our list was integer arithmetic, right? And integer arithmetic is easy. It's just type four equals two plus two. That's simple. Uh, this will work, or maybe it won't, because it's a syntax error. Because it's a type. This is not an expression. Maybe I lied to you. Maybe you shouldn't trust me so easily, right? So, how do we fix this? This is devastating. That's. That's a problem. How do you perform arithmetic on integers if you can't even use operators on them? Uh, let's see what the problem was to begin with, okay? So two is not a number here, it's a type. And you're using a plus operator as if you want to add them up, right? The problem is TypeScript doesn't understand what plus means for two, right? It doesn't know what uh, the number two represents, right? Uh, it doesn't know if it's greater than one or less than one. So uh, how do we do that? So what I did was I had to go for a different representation. So computers represent numbers in binary, right? Similar to that, we're going to represent as the numbers as tuples. So if you want to represent the number one, you're going to have a tuple with a zero in it. To represent the number two, you're going to have a tuple with two zeros in it. To represent the number, let's say 400, you're going to have a tuple with 400 zeros in it, right? But why did we choose to do it this way? Why not something else? Uh, it's random, really. There are many other representations that you can work with. So if you have worked with theorem proving languages like Idris, Agnew, Koch, whatever, then you know about inductive types, right? You could have used an inductive type here, or you could have just used binary. That would also work. But I chose to go with this because it makes it a lot shorter. It uh, makes my presentation easier, right? Okay, so we can represent numbers as tuples with zeros in that, uh, inside them. But this is very inconvenient. Every time I want to write five, I'm not going to write a tuple, and I'm not going to count the number of zeros in it, right? So it would be great if we had a helper, something like this, something uh, which I could pass a number to, and it would just return to me a tuple, right? So n of two should ideally return me a tuple with two zeros. That would be great. Uh, it would be even better uh, if I had a helper function called add, which could add numbers in this notation. So if I pass it a tuple with a zero and a tuple with two zeros, it returns to me a tuple with three zeros. That would be great. Uh, but how do we implement that, right? N and add right now are not defined. This won't compile. We haven't defined what N is. We haven't defined what add is, uh, but we're going to. To do that, we need to implement some utility functions first, starting with finding the length of a tuple type. So to understand 
uh, what the tuple with two zeros means, we need to be able to figure out the number of items in it, right? So you have this helper called tuplin, which takes an array type, right? A extends unknown array, and we just read out the length property of, of an array, right? So again, this is uh, a member access at compile time. This is not runtime code, meaning that if you just use, like if you just call tuplin on a Boolean array, it would give you the type number because the length of any array is number, right? But if you use tuples here, uh, it can actually give you the actual length of the tuple. Now, why is that? Uh, that's because in TypeScript, tuples uh, have a restriction that it, they can only contain a fixed number of items, right? The type system will do everything in its power to stop you from changing the number of items in a tuple. Uh, so if you call tuplin on one, two, three, the type system is going to correctly infer the number of items in it. So a dot length is going to be three. Uh, of course, if you try tuplin of Boolean array, it's just going to be number because the length of an array uh, is going to be a number. That's all we can guarantee at compile time. Okay, so tuplin is done. Uh, what if we had a function called make tup uh, that could create tuples for us and we just had to give it numbers, right? So we're going to implement that. We have a function called make tup and it takes two parameters. The first parameter is n, a number. The second parameter is a, it's an accumulator parameter, which is why it has a default value of empty array, right? So you don't need to explicitly call make tup with the empty array. So, okay. We have make tup, it takes a number n, it takes an array a, and then it checks if the length of the tuple is already equals to n. So if this is equal, then it means we have successfully uh, created a, an array with n number of zeros in it, and we simply return a. Uh, if the tuple n is not equal to n, it means we need one more zero and then we can recursively call make tup, right? So if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you, uh, you can look at a version that I have written in pure like runtime TypeScript. So this is how you would do it in runtime TypeScript, right? You have a number n, you have a number a, sorry, an array a, and you check if a dot length is equal to n. If this is the case, then you return a because that's our base case for the recursion. Otherwise, you recursively call make tup. Our target is still the same, except our accumulator now has an extra zero in it. Uh, and this obviously works. I can uh, run this. Uh, personal TS fun. Yarn TS node SRC. Uh, this is called. And there it is. Uh, sure enough, it gave me it uh, an array with 12 zeros. So what I have done here is equivalent to what I did in the runtime JavaScript code. It just looks ugly. Okay. Uh, now we're going to define a wrapper for make up an alias because every time I want a number. Uh, writing five zeros is just as bad as writing mktup. So instead, I'm just going to call it n, okay? So n of three is going to give me a tuple with three zeros inside it. Okay, so we can successfully convert numbers into tuples. Uh, what about arithmetic? How can we add them together? Okay, we're going to try this method. So we have a function called n, and it takes two parameters, a and b, both numbers. And what it does is it creates two tuples. The first tuple is going to have a zeros. The second tuple is going to have b zeros. And then we're going to use the spread operator to put them in the same tuple. So we have a zeros followed by b zeros. And when you use the tuple in operator on a uh, tuple with a zeros followed by b zeros, you get a plus b. So we have successfully implemented integer addition. Does it work? Uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, So I've also implemented subtraction and comparison here because if you understand, if you follow everything in this talk so far clearly, then you will have no problem implementing both of these as well. Uh, but just for convenience sake, um, I have these written out uh, already. Okay, so let's try. Type underscore equals add three, five, for example. Uh, that works. Yeah, you can see the sum of three and five is eight. If I did 10, five, it gives me 15, the term of the sum of 10 and 5 is 15. Uh, I can also do subtraction, so I've implemented a subtract method. It gives you the difference. I've also implemented greater than, so you get 10 is greater than 5. Of course, that's true. Uh, is 1 greater than 5? No, of course, that's not. Uh, using these three, you can implement pretty much anything. I hope you can trust me with that, right? Uh, multiplication is this repeated addition. You can implement division, modulo, what, what have you. OK, adding numbers is done. Uh, how about Fibonacci numbers? So whenever you learn a new programming language, this is 
Uh, it's not uncommon for people to try out programs like the Fibonacci number to familiarize themselves with the syntax, right? And since we are learning type level programming here, uh, why not go with a Fibonacci number implementation? So we have a function called fib, and it takes a number called num, and then it checks if num is equal to zero or one. Uh, because the zeroth Fibonacci number is zero, the first Fibonacci number is uh, one. So if that's true, then we simply return num. If that's not true, then we recursively call Fibonacci number, we pass it num minus one, and then we add num to the recursive call, right? This is very uh, standard Fibonacci function. This is what you would do in a uh, declarative programming language as well. So let me open up the Fibonacci program, and I'm going to close the terminal on the right. I don't think you need that. Okay, so export um, type something is fib of, let's say, 10. And sure enough, we have 55. That's, that's correct. Fib of 12 is 78. That is also correct. So, okay, Fibonacci numbers work. Uh, what else can we do? Can we, can we sort arrays? Yes, we can. Uh, this is quick sort implemented entirely in the type system, right? Uh, but how does it work? Uh, if you've followed everything so far, you can understand this easy. This is this nothing extra in this. Uh, but I want to compare it with a sorting algorithm I've written uh, here in Haskell, right? So this is a sorting algorithm in Haskell. It's quick sort, and you'll notice that this is much smaller than if you were to write the same program in a declarative language, right? That's because we have pattern matching. And the type system really helps us out with a lot of things. So what you're doing is you have a left partition that contains all the numbers less than x. You have a right partition that contains all the numbers greater than x. And then you're merging these partitions. You're recursively calling quicksort on each partition. And you're combining the result, right? This is quicksort in Haskell. Uh, I don't think I need to run this one for you. But I know you're interested in the quicksort uh, in TypeScript. So I have it here. And you'll notice that in my slide, I don't have a partition helper, but I'm using it. I have it in my file. Uh, that is because I couldn't fit all of this into one slide. So I'm trying quick sort, let's say, uh, three, four, five, one, nine, right? And it can sort it for me. It has one, three, four, five, nine. This is correct. It sorted it correctly. Uh, again, I know that you probably won't understand all of this if this is your first time doing type level programming. So I've put all of this code on GitHub and the link is going to be available to you at the end of this talk. For now, let's just run with what we have. Okay, quick sort is done. Uh, so where does it stop? We can, we can calculate Fibonacci numbers, we can do integer arithmetic, we can sort arrays. Uh, is there a ceiling, is there a bar, is there something we cannot do? Uh, turns out there isn't because the type system is Turing complete. Uh, so back in 2017, following the release of TypeScript 2.2, uh, a user on GitHub created this issue on TypeScript's repository on GitHub. And it reads, TypeScript's type system is Turing complete. And then he presented a little proof uh, uh, for his claim, right? What does it mean for something to be Turing complete? Well, it means that you can simulate a Turing machine in your system, right? What is a Turing machine? A Turing machine is an abstract mathematical computational model, uh, which inspires a lot of our modern CPU architectures. So it predates von Neumann, but it's really just a memory tape that you can do arithmetic on. Right? It's a very simple model of computation. And there is this language called BrainFuck. I'm sure everyone here has heard of it. Right? Uh, BrainFuck is a language. It's an esoteric language. It's a for fun language. You don't any really do serious programming with it. Uh, it only has eight instructions, but it's Turing complete. It can compute pretty much anything, right? So you have a memory tape, uh, which is like 65,000 uh, cells long. Each cell holds a number. And you have these uh, two characters to sort of move in the memory tape. You have these two operators to increment or decrement the value at the current position. These two braces are used for looping. And the final two characters are used for I.O. Uh, I hope you already know about BrainFuck. I'm not going to explain the uh, semantics of the entire language to you. So, but you're going to have to take my word for it that it is Turing complete. Okay. So hear me out. BrainFuck is a Turing complete pr uh, programming language, right? If I can implement BrainFuck in TypeScript's type system, that is kind of a proof that TypeScript type system is Turing complete, right? That's showing isomorphism. So that's a proof, uh, and I did it. I have a 
brainfuck interpreter written entirely in TypeScript's type system, right? And obviously I'm not going to, I, I would have loved to build this out with you guys here on this podium. Uh, unfortunately, the time won't allow for that. So instead, I'm going to put all of this up on GitHub. You can just reference the repository. The link is going to be at the end. Um, let me explain this to you really quickly, right? So in our BrainFork interpreter, we have this thing called a tape, which is our memory tape. You can see that it only has three numbers inside it. That is completely for presentation's sake. You can have 200, 500, 1,000 numbers uh, long tape, and it would work just as good. A zero tape is a tape with all zeros, of course. And then you have some numbers which increment and decrement the value at the current position in the tape. Now note that this program is written for readability because, you know, this could have been much shorter uh, in cat and decat. These two functions could have been a single type, but I didn't do that because if you go ahead and read this code, I want you to be able to understand this. So it's completely commented out. Uh, and then you have this thing called state, which is your current state of computation. Uh, the state contains a tape, which is the current memory tape, followed by a data pointer which is uh, sort of like the current memory address that you're indexing, followed by a code pointer, which is uh, a pointer, point, it points to the current instruction that we're executing in the source code. And then we have an output buffer, which contains uh, all output that is uh, you know, spit out by the interpreter. And this loop stack is just an implementation detail It's how I do looping. Uh, so I had these things, uh, these helper functions, you can think of them like transformers. So the next transformer takes a state, it increments the code pointer by one, and then it returns the uh, new state. Uh, the increment transformer takes the state, increments the value at the current memory address by one, returns to you. Uh, you have a decrement, you have move left, move right, print. And above every function, I have written a snippet of JavaScript, uh, which explains to you what this exactly does, right? Because this TypeScript thing may not be obvious to you from the get-go. Uh, so this start loop begins a loop, and this is our initial state. So we start with all zeros, data pointer at zero, no output, code pointer at zero, and an empty loop stack. Uh, down here, I have this function called uh, interpret, which is the heart of this interpreter, right? So it goes, it inspects your string instruction by instruction, and at every instruction, it mutates the state a little, and then recursively calls interpret on the next instruction, right? And once again, I have, uh, JavaScript snippets return here, uh, written here. In fact, if you go to this repository, if you go to this uh, file, and you take all the comments, and take none of the uncommented code, and you string that together, you'll have a JavaScript brain fork interpreter. This is just for reference, so you can uh, understand what this code is doing. Uh, and then I have a wrapper around interpret to make things easier for me. So let's, uh, let's try a brain fork function, right? Uh, a program. Here I have my tape initialized to 30, 40, and zero. So in the first cell, I have 30. In my second cell, I have 40, and in my last cell, I have zero. And I have this brainfuck program which performs addition. So how it does is it starts a loop, it increments the value in the first position, moves ahead, increments, sorry, decrements the value in uh, position zero, goes to position one, it increments this, comes back, decrements this, goes to top, increments this, and it does this until uh, the position, at, the value at position zero becomes uh, zero. So if I try to inspect this type, you'll see that I have the sum here. This is uh, 70, the sum of 30 and 40. Let's try uh, an empty tape. So let's start out with uh, no tape at all. And let's see if we can print things, right? So BrainFuck has this where uh, if you want to print something, you need to do it via ASCII code. So if I want to print A, I have to uh, print, I have to get a cell to hold 65, and then I have to use the dot operator on that cell. So instead, I'm going to print out the exclamation mark. The exclamation mark has 33, uh, the value of 33 in ASCII. So I'm going to, that's, uh, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I hope that's 11. Uh, and then I'm going to print whatever is in my current cell. And you can see in the output, so in the tape, of course, I have 33 because I incremented the first cell 33 times. And then in the output, I'm printing out the ASCII value of 33, which is exclamation mark, right? So we have this BrainFuck interpreter, and you can find this uh, on my GitHub. The link is right here. And that's it. That concludes my talk. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Oh, if you put add string, comma, number. Yeah, let's try that. Uh, 
let's try go to arith dot i think it was arith dot ts yes uh it's going to give you an error i can tell you that much because the constraints will not be satisfied but if you want to see it uh number comma string you do that it tells you the instantiates in excessively deep so this is typescript's way of saying that your call is incorrect uh this is not the correct error message actually because string has to extend number so this type constraint is not satisfied but because add is apparently too complicated it just bails out and says i'm not going to do this uh yeah it won't work <laughs>